Good afternoon. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk this afternoon um, and the people that invited me. Uh, basically, I was requested to uh, talk a little bit about the risk of uh, endometriosis and the risk of malignant transformation in patients with endometriosis. Um, so endometriosis, as we all know, is a prevalent disease um, with a general a prevalence of 10% in the public. And uh, we know that it's debilitating in some instances, uh, causing pain that is um, not compatible with normal life. And in some cases, infertility and um, other known symptoms. Um, the, I came upon a patient uh, that uh, had actually um, cancer arising in the background of endometriosis, and I had to go and look at this uh, phenomenon. And um, the incidence is very small. It's um, about 1%, and in most cases, uh, the primary site is ovarian. And... Um, that phenomenon is known as endometriosis-associated ovarian carcinoma, if you look for it. Cancer can arise in other sites as well, uh, like the endometrium uh, and all the other spaces where you can find endometriosis, uh, and including the uh, cervix, vagina, and umbilicus. So, I wrote down. Okay. So uh, what are the risk factors? Are the slides easy to read? No? Can you, can you see them? <laughs> OK, let's continue. So what are the risk factors? Um, it's prolonged estrogen exposure, exposure following a surgery for endometriosis. These would be patients that are probably overweight and uh, also who will receive estrogen, which we won't give, but it, it, it has been found in such patients. And uh, before the days of uh, progestogen-only treatment, I, I'm sure a lot of doctors used to give combined estrogen-progestogen preparations to suppress endometriosis, although we know better now. Uh, obesity is one of the uh, risk factors. Uh, in 40% of cases, if you have endometriosis and are obese, you are likely to uh, get uh, cancer arising from endometriosis. Uh, in patients with a race CA1 to 5 and a pelvic mass, we have to look deeper and uh, a long-standing history of endometriosis. And also those patients uh, that are diagnosed with endometriosis uh, early, meaning that it's been ongoing for a long time, and uh, also endometriosis associated with infertility. Um, so that was an introduction. So I, I'd like to share with you the patient that I came across. She was 36 years old, para zero. She had a previous miscarriage. She had a known uh, history of endometriosis, and she had had surgery uh, to control the uh, endometriosis or to, to remove the pain um, and, and uh, dysmenorrhea. After the initial surgery, she actually did well. However, she had a recurrence of uh, deep pelvic pain and severe dysmenorrhea. Uh, many years after the initial surgery. Like I said, in the olden days, patients used to be put on a, on a combined oral contraceptive, and she was on one. Um, she was otherwise healthy with no medical comorbidities, uh, normal BMI, with a normal uh, cervical smear, and um, not really desiring a pregnancy. The ultrasound showed uh, an enlarged uterus, with a, an even bigger cervix and a left adnexal mass. Um, and it was suspected that she had a left endometrioma. <coughs> so uh, she was actually taken for uh, a second uh, uh, surgical look at the endometriosis. 
And um, on like uh, examination, the the end of cervix was found to be enlarged. The the hysteroscope was planned, but it was abandoned because the endometri the the cervix was enlarged and there was uh, tumor like looking tissue coming out of the cervical os. Biopsies were taken and higher up biopsies were taken as well. Uh, with the laparoscopy, the pouch of Douglas was obliterated, and upon mobilization and adhesiolysis, um, the right adnexum appeared uh, relatively normal. But on the left side, where the endometrium was suspected, uh, the tube and the ovary were, were fixed together with bowel, so it was one mass with vesicle on, vesicles on top of it. So. Um, a malignancy was suspected from the beginning when they, we found um, tissue from the uterus and uh, also with the left scope, uh, the vesicles uh, and, and the implants on, on the mass were suspicious. So because of a, a suspicion of a carcinoma, no further surgery was undertaken and the patient was referred uh, for assessment. Uh, biopsies were taken uh, from the pouch of Douglas, uh, the uterosacral ligaments, uh, the left ovarian fossa, as well as uh, uh, the left ovary, just superficially. Um, in the end and in the beginning, basically, this patient was found to have a grade one well-differentiated endometrioid adenocarcinoma with a figure stage of 1B. We'll talk about her in the end. Uh, the tumor was strongly estrogen positive. It also had progesterone receptors. Uh, the ovary was uh, also an adenocarcinoma, endometrioid type, grade 2, and she was stage figure stage 2C. The left ovarian fossa uh, showed, and all the other biopsies showed endometriosis. So uh, now that I've presented the patient, we can like now start talking about this phenomenon when it was described. Uh, first time, uh, there was a paper in 1925 by Samson where he had studied this phenomenon. And um, after studying several cases, he then came up with a, a three criteria that were required to say that if uh, the tumor was arising from endometriosis, it must satisfy these criteria. And uh, another author in 1953 adapted uh, the Samson's criteria but added a fourth criterion. And basically, uh, I'm sure you can read, uh, it's all those four criteria. Uh, the, uh, this slide is much clearer than the rest of the talk. Uh, basically, the, the carcinoma and the endometriosis must occur in the same organ, and the carcinoma must arise from the same tissue and not coming from another source. There must be presence of tissue resembling ovarian stroma, and you must remember initially they found most of the tumors in the ovary, uh, and there must be a morphologic demonstration of benign endometriosis around the malignant tissue, so surrounding the malignant tissue. So, um, the, what are the common histological subtypes that are associated with endometriosis? Uh, in 85, 80 to 85% of the cases is the endometrioid type, and in, in fewer cases you get uh, the more aggressive clear cell carcinoma. And also they say uh, in 32% of the uh, uh, samples or in occasions, you have to look for endometrial pathology on all the patients because 32% cases there will be uh, endometrial pathology. Um, so in a Danish study, basically what these people, uh, the, the authors wanted to do in 2012 is to find out uh, what is the risk of uh, endometriosis and developing one of the female cancers being ovarian endometrial and breast carcinoma. And um, they reported uh, the incident as standard uh, incidence ratios because they were comparing with the general population. And uh, essentially there was increased risk for all the tumors, uh, female, female uh, cancers. 
So what are the common features that are shared by endometriosis and uh, malignancy? Uh, they both uh, exhibit recurrence and genomic instability. So basically they, they have unregulated uh, cell proliferation. They can evade apoptosis. They have stem cell-like ability. Uh, they can generate their own vessels and uh, they can regulate their own pro proliferation. And uh, like tumors, endometriosis uh, has been found to be monoclonal in origin and there is somatic mutations of certain genes uh, that uh, enhance its uh, tra transformation to malignancy and also a less of heterozygosity. So that's all uh, surrounding the uh, genetic component. So now the couple of next slides, essentially we're looking at the uh, pathophysiology or the systems that are uh, inherent in both endometriosis and uh, tumors. Um, so one of them is uh, impaired apoptosis. So this uh, impaired apoptosis is implicated in the pathogenesis of benign and malignant disease. Uh, it's regulated by B cell lymphoma 2 and protein 53. Uh, essentially, B cell lymphoma 2 is an anti apoptotic molecule and um, it is upregulated in endometriosis. P53, on the other hand, uh, is a signal for apoptosis in cases of major DNA damage. So what happens here is that uh, when they look at the samples, they find that the P53 is mutated and has become non-functional. And the non-functional mutated P53 is overexpressed, meaning that it's not signaling apoptosis. So, and uh, it accumulates within the nutrient cells and interferes with uh, the, the, the mutated uh, with the signaling function and it uh, promotes further damage. Uh, from the immunological perspective and adding to this, uh, the T and B lymphocytes are abnormal and uh, as we know, they will mount a response and lead to tissue damage. And what they found is that um, the activation of B lymphocytes also leads to altered apoptosis. So, uh, the next, maybe this should, this should have come before apoptosis, but it doesn't really matter. Inflammation is considered to be the hallmark of endometriosis. Um, essentially, the peritoneal fluid of women with endometriosis has a high level of macrophages, cytokines, and growth factors. So basically, uh, the one uh, macrophage, MMP9, is known to be uh, critical in breaking down extracellular matrix. So this MMP9, um, actually what it does, it, it imparts the cells with endometriosis to, to uh, secrete macrophages which degrade extracellular matrix. And the stromal cell is then uh, changed and uh, more tumor, uh, tumor um, factors are activated. So it becomes like a, uh, an inflammatory uh, cycle, so to speak, uh, because then the cells become trophic and they, they, they progress to malignancy. Still on inflammation, there's angiogenesis uh, and, and the expression of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, which um, has been found in almost uh, all the samples of endometriosis associated with ovarian cancer. So we know angiogenesis is uh, required for tumor progression. Um, still both uh, endometriosis and cancer seem to have this stem cell-like activity where the, the uh, uh, induced by <coughs> estrogen, they express telomerase enzyme and this enzyme imparts uh, uh, increased pro proliferative ability. So uh, then the cells are self-renewing 
and that's that's increased and the enzyme is like upregulated and then again it's a vicious cycle contributing to the uh, transformation because of unregulated proliferation. Uh, coming to the genetic part, like I said, these slides are just uh, pathophysiology and we'll go through them, but we'll come to the clinical part, which is more uh, nicer than these slides. But in a way, I'm apologizing, but let's continue. <laughs> Most uh, uh, of these uh, neoplasms, including endometriosis, are known to be uh, monoclonal, and there is a proven monoclonality in endometriosis also a loss of heterozygosity uh, in the regions of the uh, tumor suppressor gene uh, in activation. So uh, where the tumor suppressor gene should be acting at, 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 the, at, at that region, uh, the, the, there's loss of heterozygosity and that is uh, causing inactivation of the gene. Uh, and that, that is uh, said to be central to the development of the tumor. And um, several uh, studies have shown this loss of heterozygosity in the samples, uh, histological samples of endometriosis and ovarian cancer arising from endometriosis. Uh, still staying on the genomic instability, more um, mutated genes uh, one of them being HMLH1. Uh, in this case, it's not loss of heterozygosity, but hypermethylation. And uh, so some people say, authors say that you get endometriosis, and in transition to malignant transformation, you get atypical endometriosis. And it appears as though this hypermethylation is found both in endometriosis and in stage four, I mean atypical endometriosis and stage four endometriosis. Atypical endometriosis, basically the cells have become hypertrophic with, um, with uh, morphological abnormalities. So uh, this uh, gene, this particular gene, calls for an enzyme which is uh, involved with DNA mismatch repair system. So the hypermethylation leads to silencing of the gene. So Therefore, it becomes inactive, and they think that this inactivity is also one of the markers we should be looking for uh, in patients with endometriosis. So I guess we, if you want to do a study, you could send all your endometriosis samples for stage four patients to see if uh, there are any changes there um, that are suspicious. So there are also endocrine factors that are involved here, being estrogen, uh, we know estrogen is a potent mitogenic factor, uh, and uh, the enzyme that's responsible for its biosynthesis is expressed in um, endometriosis and uh, ovarian endometriosis. Uh, we know that uh, when we find a tumor, especially with the female cancers, we look for receptor positivity and uh, and then we treat accordingly. So um, the, basically it's a cascade. So uh, the enzyme is induced, it releases uh, COX-2, uh, and COX-2 activates uh, prostatlandins, and then further damage is uh, done. So Basically, we've gone through the difficult part, which were the uh, biological mechanisms of uh, tumor formation and uh, uh, processes that occur in endometriosis that are similar to both. So now we come to uh, the more clinical stuff. Uh, there has been imaging uh, clinical knowledge about the fallopian tube. Uh, initially, it was not suspected, but now we know that it's a conduit that uh, transports uh, endometrium to the peritoneum. Uh, it also transports inflammation from the lower genital tract to the peritoneum. And the distal part of the fallopian tube in itself is, is where the ovulation takes place. And 
uh, the inflammation recovery, inflammation recovery seems to make it a microenvironment for inflammation. And it, it, that inflammation recovery is a, a, a key in uh, cancer initiation. Um, a lot of the studies are now showing that if you do a tubal ligation or you suppress ovulation, you reduce both the risk of endometriosis and ovarian cancer. And in fact, uh, the last study that I saw, it says uh, tubal ligation um, reduces your risk of um, epithelial ovarian cancer uh, by 30%. So, so now let's uh, move on to um, endometriosis and the female cancers, starting with the ovarian cancer. What we do know is that it is the fifth leading cause of death, cancer death in, in developed world, and the most, eighth most common in women. And the five-year survival is low or lower than that in most cases. Um, so if a patient has endometriosis, what should we be worried about in terms of their risk for epithelial ovarian cancers? First is age, if they are older if they've never had children, if their endometriosis was diagnosed at or near menopause, if they have an endometrioma that is large, or they are in a hyperestrogenic state, or they have cysts with uh, solid compartments. So in these patients uh, with endometriosis, uh, we should look deeper. Um, what We've spoken about the common histological subtypes, and again, it's endometrioid and clear cell. Uh, the good news, most of the tumors are endometrioid, and the endometrioid subtype is not aggressive, is said not to be aggressive, and you, we commonly see it in women that are younger, um, that have lower grade lesion and a good prognosis. Uh, with the clear cell carcinoma, which is said to be estrogen receptor negative, uh, it's a more aggressive tumor and is considered to be related to oxidative stress due to the uh, iron coming from the endometrioma. Um, so its uh, aggression is due to its negative receptor status. So coming to endometrial cancer, uh, there is a 40% increased risk for endometrial cancer in patients with endometriosis. And the risk is higher if, again, you diagnose at or near menopause. Luckily, it's mostly type 1 tumors that are well differentiated uh, with a good prognosis. Endometrioid in type, they are estrogen receptor positive or sensitive, and thankfully, they constitute most of the cancers. And these type of cancers, unlike the clear cell, are found mainly in younger, obese, and perimenopausal patients. Coming to uh, another female cancer, breast cancer, the authors of this uh, study, this huge, uh, big Danish study that they followed up all the patients that were, had malignancies and concurrent endometriosis, and essentially what they're saying is um, there is a 27 increased risk according to their findings and uh, more common in women that are close to menopause at the time of diagnosis. Um, but then they say both conditions are hormone related and both conditions are, have a common feature of inflammation. And again, uh, they think they are probably partly, the, the, the high risk of breast cancer is probably partly due to obesity and HRT. So what they're saying is, yes, there is an association, but it may be partly due, due to obesity and a hormone replacement therapy. So now, uh, so I asked myself, okay, should we classify or be thinking about 
putting endometriosis in the cancer category or not, maybe too soon, uh, maybe the, no, more has to be done, more studies. But we all know that endometriosis is considered benign. And when I was doing this talk, I went to the <laughs> blogs of women with endometriosis, and they were sharing their experiences, and they say they feel like dying, and some have uh, even considered suicide, which is interesting. Uh, the pain is that debilitating. So we know that we can found, find both endometriosis in local and distant tissue. And those who do endometriosis surgery know that it, they can find it anywhere in the body, um, matches with the cancer in the pericardium, in the pleura, in the brain, and sometimes lying on nerves. So it's very aggressive disease, endometriosis. And um, I really did ask myself at this stage whether we should really uh, not categorize these patients under the you know, banner of cancer because these patients are unable to take care of themselves, are unable to work with pain. And we also know that be with like a malignancy, there is a diagnostic delay between endometriosis uh, from the time you have the disease to the time you, you diagnose, there is a delay. Same as in cancer, most people um, present later. So also I wanted, I was like thinking about this, I was like, does endometriosis kill? Should you call it a cancer minus the cancer? And I, I wanted to see, is it lethal? And I actually came upon an article on The Lancet where they were uh, doing uh, all-cause global motility. And they look at different uh, causes of death and uh, what was causing the death and how much of it. And uh, <coughs> approximately 100 deaths were reported in 2015 from endometriosis the, the whole dossier is quite long. They don't go into what kills the patient, but they, they just say the cause of death was associated with endometriosis. So I thought, okay, it, maybe it's not a cancer, but it appears to kill the patient as well. So, uh, and if it transformed to a malignancy, then there is actually a risk of uh, death from endometriosis, if there is malignant transformation and you get an aggressive tumor like a clear cell type. So maybe the oncologist will help here to tell us, should we, as reproductive specialists, uh, send them these patients to, to actually, uh, you know, counsel or see or talk to about their risk? I'm not sure. Um, so, does it require particular vigilance? Uh, currently, there, there's no screening uh, methods or guidelines. Uh, we must just know the inherent risk factors, and we must always have a high index of suspicion. Um, what uh, do other authors think? They think we should uh, carefully follow up these patients. Uh, Ultrasound is mandatory to monitor an endometrioma that may be growing. And uh, those who have MRI have gone as far as looking at uh, the changes in the MRI that uh, will make you suspicious, like um, the presence of one or more contrast material enhance uh, nodules in the, in the cyst wall and uh, the enlargement of the endometrioma, the size of it, and uh, most of the authors put it at nine centimeters or more. And uh, those who do look at the MRI, they say there is a disappearance of shading in some of the images. So some authors say, you know, we've, we've seen that endometriosis and cancer are common in certain instances. So how do we actually go forward 
and <coughs> this is what was lacking from all the literature that um, even though we know this, we haven't really come up with any a way to maybe um, screen the patients with the risk of malignant transformation who have endometriosis. Um, so some, some patients, uh, or most studies, uh, have shown that salpingectomy is protective and there is a vocation for um, removal of the endometrioma, meaning not the ovary, but the whole cyst in total. Uh, being reproductive specialists, we are jealous of the ovary. So, you know, uh, maybe this should be taken away from us and the oncologist should say, yes, this endometrioma must go, otherwise it will damage the host. But uh, there is uh, advocation for removing the whole endometrioma instead of like ablating the cyst or leaving some of the endometriotic tissue to save the um, ovarian reserve. Um, so I then was still looking, what are the guidelines? How should we counsel the patients? Should we tell them about the risk? Uh, you know, and essentially, I eventually came upon the extra guidelines. What they're saying is uh, we must uh, counsel the women that seek information that at this stage, we don't have enough evidence that endometriosis causes cancer. But I'm not sure about this because we already have an incidence and the subtypes have been described. I don't know why they came up with this guideline. We can all discuss this. And uh, they say we must tell patients there's no increase in overall incidence of cancer in women with endometriosis, which was confusing for me, but I had to look. Um, again, the same group, the guideline uh, group said uh, that there's no, um, there is uh, increase incidence in some of the cancers so uh, but when we do explain it to the patient we must give them in absolute numbers so that also was confusing maybe somebody can uh, assist me there is it the percentages or what I'm not sure but that's what they say uh, please um, that's open for discussion and they say that at the moment, we do not change our practice. Um, and um, we continue as we are. So as we cancel patients for endometriosis uh, stage four or surgery, do we tell them we might go in and find a malignancy or not? Apparently, there is no clinical data or uh, to show that, the, you know, there is a uh, that we can reduce this risk, so there's, they say we shouldn't actually uh, go there or be aggressive in in our counselling. Um, so I thought to myself, okay, I've gone through this, and what wh what what do I take from this? And well, there is a risk of malignant transformation from endometriosis to cancer, but it is small. And essentially the guidelines are saying there's no need for us to alarm the patient. Um, when we do counsel the patients, we must counsel them taking into consideration their risk factors, their age, and the timing of diagnosis of the endometriosis. And if we encounter patients with endometriosis who have completed their family, we can advise them to do a bilateral salpingectomy. So I'm sure you want to know by now what happened to my patient or to the patient that I encountered. Um, I looked at the uh, five year and 10 year survival rate of uh, stage one tumors of the endometrium and they have a very good five year and 10 year survival rate. Uh, of, um, and I looked also at the ovary 
and also the, the, if you have the endometrial type, you have a good uh, survival rate. Uh, and they say that at all sites, including the ovary, the five-year survival rate is 82%. Um, this patient received uh, um, surgery from gynae oncologist in two stages. First stage, they went in with the purpose of debulking, but the pelvis was not friendly, so they did a BSO. And uh, they then uh, gave a gonadal peptide to reduce the um, uterine size, and as well as chemotherapy, three causes. And she went back to theater, and uh, a TAH was done after the BSO. And at the moment, she's alive and well uh, with a guided prognosis. Um, this is uh, what I have to offer this afternoon. Um, uh, the slides read okay with me, but I'll be mindful next time to harden my ink. Thank you, Master. Oh. Thank you much for wonderful talk. I did apologize. Feel free uh, to help yes. me, Tabo and whoever, and Prof, <laughs> with the questions. <laughs> As far as I can figure out, if mm. you've got endometriosis, you, you've got a risk of ovarian, or you've got a risk of developing a cancer where that endometriosis is. Yeah. Most commonly on the ovary. Mm. Okay, so put that aside. As oncologists, we advise bilateral salpingectomies to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer. For papillary serous type cancers, that start off as sticks in the fallopian tube. So what is the reason for doing a bilateral salpingectomy for a papillary serous cancer when you're trying to prevent an endometrioid cancer? Mm. Or are you only going to do that if there's endometriosis on the tubes? And if you're going to do that to reduce the risk of endometrio endometrioid cancer and you've got endometriosis on the ovaries, then why not remove the ovary <coughs> at the same time? Um. Yes, essentially what she's saying is that they do bilateral salpingectomy for uh, serous type tumors. So why do them in uh, endometrial type and clear cell type? Um, again, if you looked at the, at the pathophysiology, there is a slide where uh, the tube is intrinsically involved in the inflammatory pro process, both in endometriosis and in uh, uh, malignancy. So again, the tube is involved with the inflammation around the ovary with the ovulation um, repair mechanism. So if we remove the tube, then we re remove that inflammatory microenvironment. So it applies to us as well. We wouldn't uh, willingly uh, remove an ovary uh, unless if there the is uh, a suspicion of malignancy uh, because we worried about the ovarian reserve. But in a patient with a, a family that is completed, yes, that is a consideration. Um, <coughs> thank you. We had a similar talk um, not too long ago at the Southern Suburbs Gynae Oncology um, around where Judy Whitaker, the pathologist working with Lancet, was um, talking about atypical endometriosis, which is a very difficult concept for a pathologist um, because I see cellular atypia within the background of, um, of endometriosis, and, and there one is actually a little bit uncertain whether this is a, a malignant process or whether it's um, sort of endometriosis. 
I, I think if you want to sort of say endometriosis is a, is, a, is, a, is a cancer, definitely no, because we are missing certain things like um, stromal invasion, the ability to metastasize, to, although that is also not entirely true, but, mm. but I think atypical endometriosis becomes very difficult mm. to know where, where that falls. It's probably something like a borderline tumor, if you want to think about Yes. That. In fact... No, I'm just saying atypical endometriosis is very difficult to say. It's a pity you haven't talked a little bit about atypical endometriosis. Yeah, so yeah. Condition, yeah. But I think I said one thing. <laughs> you, you only know where there's atypical endometriosis if you have histology. And you, mm. you, I mean, there's no indication to take all patients with endometriosis to theatre. Um, I think perspective is a good thing, and your closing remarks to say that this we do see it from time to time we see them in an oncology clinic but it's it's still very rare and I don't think we should regard endometriosis as a pre malignant condition just remember it is endometrial epithelium uh, so obviously it is also susceptible to any sort of inflammatory or pro-oncogenic uh, process that may uh, transform some of the tissue into malignant tissue. Um, but to start screening and for something that is so rare, so I, I, I don't think that's worth the while. No, I think we're all agree. If we find a patient with a, like, with a, nodules and stage 4 endometriosis, should we say something about the risk or nothing? Because that's what the literature says, we say nothing. Every patient sitting in front of you, inform them about the risk of each and every cancer that they might get now. So I don't think I'll include it in my counseling. Okay. If they don't have pain or discomfort or they are not symptomatic from the endometriosis, no, um, then if you put them on progesterone, you, there's, at that point, although you know there's endometriosis, but there's no symptoms, so there's nothing really to treat. And we cannot put patients on medication for fear of uh, future malignancies. So no, personally, I wouldn't uh, be guided by the disease. I would be guided by the symptoms.